Podcast, the weekly pseudo-academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co-host, Bo Gang. We got Wayne and Hannah and Katya. I don't know how you're doing. I don't have a better question. How are you guys doing? You know. Yeah. I was saying... <laughs> I, don't, I still don't know how to respond to this question. Yeah. I, I don't... Yeah. Maybe maybe we should brainstorm some questions together. Maybe our should, listeners should submit questions like, "What is your favorite kind of Ooh, jelly bean?" We, we could do like a really dumb AMA at the top of the show. Yeah, send us your <laughs> dumbest questions. I want to answer dumb questions. I think that'd be more fun. Well, what what is everyone's favorite kind of jelly bean? It's Easter ish time. Oh. I don't know. I've lost track of the calendar. I mean, time is I don't like jelly beans. Yeah, I'm not a big um, fan. <laughs> that was an easy the question. Here, what? Like, I'm not a big jelly bean person, but if I had to eat jelly bean, I think I would go with the root beer kind. I, I don't know. I think I get some weird like pleasure in like going through the flavors and eating the ones I like and saving the bad ones for later <laughs> to never be eaten. I don't know. I just I th- I think jelly beans are like a decoration for the Easter basket that like for some reason people eat, but like really, why would you do that when there are eggs and candy and stuff in there? Like, <laughs> well, there's chocolate. Why eggs? would I want jelly beans? I do. I like boiled eggs. Mm. See, there you go. <laughs> so we're going to do a trade and where I, 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 oddly enough, boiled egg jelly beans are my favorite flavor. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not I, true. I, I gonna, but we can do a trade where like, you know, I can mail Hannah all my jelly beans and she can mail all the eggs. And, you know, that's clearly a good idea in the U.S. Postal yeah, that, System. That, so <laughs> that, that seems like a very good idea. I I'm, look yeah, I'm sure it. someone... Yep, that's that's gonna go real well. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> sure that uh, yeah. when it makes it to your house, Steph will be very happy mm-hmm. when you open that package. Yeah, or, or you know, or I can just buy my own damn eggs up the store, <laughs> up the street. So I'll be fine. It's it's good. So um, <laughs> we're not- I'm just gonna say, like every, I feel like I am now measuring the pandemic by how bloody weird our top of the show conversation is. <laughs> yeah, the the, in, the inane conversation. Is it, you can probably track the slow descent into complete and utter madness of isolation <laughs> oh, good. by analyzing something about the first five minutes I, of the show. I feel, like, I feel like there was a time, and I can't remember when, because blurs time, where I was very sad and you could just tell, and now I think I'm happier, despite <laughs> not much not changing, happy. to be honest. Because <laughs> you've not left the house and you've not left the house in the year and a half and you've settled into it it's like, i guess it's only been a year oh, I, wow. I, I listened i listened madness. i listened to our old um episode about bad things we love and i believe that the first thing i said was and maybe maybe i listened to a different episode uh and i just can't remember anything now it, i was like you know what's sad that i was actually quarantining through like january and february because i was trying to finish my dissertation and now here i am and that was like may <laughs> and now yeah, that's kind of how i felt it's like my my actually my my isolation started a little bit before the pandemic but that was more self and well self-imposed grad school imposed yeah. we'll go with that mm-hmm. which you know is not that i can't blame on a infectious disease that is yeah i, I had some of that due to unemployment before the, you know I, I was already not leaving the house because i didn't have a job to go to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. You know, it was a, gra- it was a secretly all training too. for for later life. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so you uh, mentioned, you know, in passing, sort of the topic. We're we're gonna do bad things we love part two, I guess. Although, sort although of, also kinda. not because yeah. at the end of bad things part one, we were like, you know, honestly, what is bad? A lot of these things are actually pretty good. We like all of them. Also, okay, I think we talked about this in the last episode, but but I was sitting down trying to prepare for this episode. Episode, and I feel like I have a fundamental problem with the entire pro- <laughs> because a I don't believe anything should be guilt any anyone should be made guilty to about about the media habits that they have mm-hmm. unless somehow their media habits are harming other people which you know enter pretty much every other episode of this podcast if you don't know what I'm talking about but <laughs> I mean beyond that if you're just like watching stuff that other people think is like trashy or whatever like I don't I hate those people. <laughs> Like that's, if, if that's the, like, like that's not a, like I hate I, I love to hate those people. It's just like I just don't I, I don't think you should guilt people for their media consumption. Even though I mean, in some ways, I, I feel like I sound like you know a hypocrite here because our entire show is about basically railing against certain kinds of representations and like all kinds of things we don't we don't personally like, and a lot of that is like judgy and basically being hyperbolic. But I yeah, I just it is, but we don't really. I don't feel guilty it. about. I don't feel. Yeah. 
guilty about anything that I watch or consume. I think critically mm-hmm. about it all the time, but I don't right. like hide what I do from people. Like from from the very first episode, like the ongoing joke on this show is like, you know, from like literally from when we started was always going to be how much I liked Manimal and Cop Rock. And it sort of mutated into Riverdale, the best show on television, which I know is not true. <laughs> like I know that there's I know there are faults with the Riverdale. I thoroughly enjoy it still, you know, but I but it's I I, I I'm not ashamed of it. I don't think it's a like the, 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 the time jump has revealed some cracks I mean, for me. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm not caught up, but I'm not as invested. Yeah. But I, but the thing is, like, with calling it guilty, that's why we didn't call it guilty pleasures for the first time. Right. Because I don't I don't feel any guilt over. I mean, we're going to talk about some of the things that I love right now. Some of them I know are bad. And but sometimes I enjoy the badness. Right. Well, I mean, bad with, you know, lack of see. And again, I don't want to say lack of value because I know that there is um, I know there is um, value in enjoyment. I'll give you um, as we record. And I'm not sure when episodes drop anymore. I've lost the ability to do that as we record. I'm uh, meaningless. It's fine. Yeah. Um, this is two days after Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League that people wished into existence over two years dropped. Um, I watched it all. Um, and I, and I wrote a review of it, a short review of it, um, this morning where I basically said, you know, the best thing I can say about this, I said, you know, there were a lot of things that I didn't like about it. I, I was not a fan. It was, it had some things that I actually did enjoy, but my basic review of it was, there's no point in really even me writing a, a recommendation for this because I cannot recommend this movie to anyone who wasn't going to just go watch it anyway. If you are the kind of person who's looking for Zack Snyder's Snyder cut, you are going to watch it and you are going to enjoy the hell out of it because it is exactly what you've been waiting for. For everyone else who's like, I don't want to see a Zack Snyder movie. There is nothing I can tell you about this that I could that would honestly make you want to see it because everything that you don't like about Zack Snyder is in this movie. <laughs> so like, but I don't think you should feel bad for liking things that I just think are stupid. Like, I, who am I? You know, I'm a right, guy on the you, the, you know, well, it's like our, you know, like I say, like, it's a ways of feeling a hypocrite because of the show, but it's like, we, you know, I will, first of all, I like a lot of things I can play out in this show. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. In fact, yeah. most of them, generally speaking, is like, like, I guess my thought of like a cultural, cultural criticism is like, generally speaking, if I am spending as much time as I do complaining about how like, pro- like analyzing something or complaining about like representation mm-hmm. something, it's usually because I have at least some interest in it. And often that is some level of affection. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean stop. Yeah. See, Wait, exactly. I, I, we wouldn't be holding critiques of of comics if we weren't thoroughly invested in them the way Mav and I are. Right. Oh yeah, right. absolutely. I mean, I mean that, see, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, like literally everything like, on the show because like right. classics like Jane Austen. We spent the entire time we talked about Jane Austen partially, com- well, not maybe everything, but like you know, critiquing Jane Austen. We play Empire board games. We can re-critique those board games. Like, mm-hmm. is there anything we've e- like we've ever truly just like praised with no critique? Well, no. I think that's part. I mean, that's part of the thing. Is like for me, that's critique is part of enjoying. A th- <laughs> it, it, critique is part of the thing mm-hmm. that I enjoy. I wouldn't yeah. have got. I mean, wouldn't have gone through grad school if I didn't enjoy it at some level. Right, but. Like, which is not to say that everything that I critique, I really enjoy. I have read way more Henry James uh, in my life than I yeah. am really happy never about. Do it. Well, but but that was because you had to, right? So, so the, the, <laughs> is it really? Because I had someone when we're working on this show for today, I was like trying to like make sure I had some movies, some TV shows, some books, some comics. And then when I got to books, when I got to novels, that was hard for me. I don't really have any because I realized that like. If I'm not enjoying this, like novels are too much of an investment of my time, right? If I'm if I'm not enjoying this, I'll stop. Like I was able to watch the Snyder Cut because I wanted to talk about it online. And because when I started getting bored, I was like, well, 90 more minutes and I'm, I'm done. Let me just get through this. <laughs> you know, like like I like there's a timer where I where I where I felt like I could set it and move on. But like with a novel, there's so much active participation. I have to turn pages. I have to sit there. I can't do other things. And it just becomes and if people it's a slog. say analog media isn't active. Right. But if it's a slog, I mean, it's a slog kinds of enjoyment i enjoy critiquing and basically like having having a moment of just like freaking out about over henry Henry james and not in like a positive way more of a like i mean i guess that's maybe like the like rather than yeah maybe it's not even hate it's just like i enjoy that you know it's it's 
I enjoy the process of criticism. I wouldn't call mm-hmm. that hate. I just, I just like a lot of the things that Henry James writes from like a cultural perspective for a variety of reasons. But like, I also like a lot of science, like pulp science fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> I enjoy reading it because I, I am like, because I have like a particular perspective on like its place in the history of science fiction. And there is like, and I do enjoy the aesthetic of pulp, but like, it's a different, there are different ways to enjoy things, I guess is what I'm trying to communicate. And I don't feel bad about any of them. I understand why, like, I mean, there are a lot of people who are diehard fans of Henry James and, like, think it's the pinnacle of literature. And I disagree, although I respect the position, uh, who probably would find the way that I write about Henry James uh, would want to claw my eyes out, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hannah Hannah has prefaced every review of every book from her time period I've ever heard her give in exactly that way. <laughs> well, because like, I, you know, I, uh, this is a whole thing about Henry James, but, and I'm not going to get into this super far, but there is actually, maybe this is, a, this is kind of an example of what I'm talking about in some ways and, and the sort of love to hate kind of deal. There is a sector of Henry James scholarship that's basically kind of like about like, hey, actually like Henry James is it everything that the canon made out to be and not just for, you know, um, like we've moved on and we now believe different things about, for example, women, but like the, basically it ended up like the reason he was canonized in in American literature was just like a lot of prestigious academics and people, people of letters like Henry James, but like he wasn't necessarily in his time, like exceptionally more important than the reason person I always give him counterpoint to H.G. Wells. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, I would argue in the history of Western literature, Anglophone literature, like H.G. Wells is more important than Henry James. But there's this entire subset of scholarship of basically people of, of James people and Wells people fighting over who's more important or who's whatever. And I'm like, this is an interesting argument to have just because they're kind of two opposing theories of literature. But also, like, can't, can't we have both? Yes, but like, also like, one is definitely like more both? readable than the other, and I just want to make that clear. Um, because well, I, and, that's, and I think that's why it's a great example is because it's usually cons- pitched as a argument over quality versus populism, i.e. Henry James is quote unquote good because you have to be of a particular literary interest to enjoy Henry James, whereas H.G. Wells is quote unquote, not as like bad, but like not high art because he's popular and to me it's like okay like those are two different ways of approaching literature both of which have value and they're achieving different things like i studied their letters to each other and a lot of their arguments were basically and this is why i have things to say like i i i personally am not a big fan of james is also like his demeanor i find off-putting because he basically spent most of those letters saying well you're not you're you're like not quite you're a failure as an author but like you're not doing literature the way henry james saw the way of literature was and basically from what I can tell is Henry James didn't really understand why Wells was writing the way that he was and thought it was wasn't good because well he didn't fully understand that Wells was trying to write a different kind of literature than Henry James was so like yes if you're if you're judging and if you're ju- judging H.G. Wells by the standards of, of Henry James absolutely he fails I just think that's a silly metric because it's like James is very good at what he does Wells is also very good at what he does mm-hmm. they're different things and yeah. that's fine and well, in well, fact that's yeah. part of what's cool about art you can have you can, we can walk and shoot it up at the same time guys yeah well, right. one one author puts me to sleep and the other keeps me up terrified at night because the morlocks are going to come out i mean <laughs> that, that is that is the difference clearly between uh henry james and hg wells um and i will say like i even even talk about it i've kind of done it too i you know i in, insofar as i am part of a side i well side just because like at least the articles with which I'm familiar in this space are basically pointing out like, no, H.G. Wells is just doing his own thing and it's a different kind of literature and like we should value this because to value only James and to basically say that Wells is not important in this period of literature, I mean, this is kind of reductive a little bit, but like is is classist, it is class, mm-hmm. like is, yeah. is class, classist and, and also in my opinion, like kind of anti-intellectual because it's basically saying that there's only one way to do literature, which... Hi, the history of literature, just even out of scratching the surface, demonstrates is not true. I mean, the categories of high and low art, as we've talked about on the show many times, just like annoy me to no end. If Arbitrary. Only... <laughs> what? Which is kind of what we're right, talking yeah. about. Well, yeah, too. yeah, yeah. They, like, they, they, they just they drive me crazy. If only, and there's there's more critiques than this. Just this, this idea of like low art being uh, for the masses and just not on some sort of artistic level. Just 
what, what, what it, just, no, just no, no, well, no, sir. And this, my whole pet peeve is, is I also think the argument, I mean, it, the entire idea that like we judge what's good based off of us, like as almost like the antithesis of what's popular is kind of silly to me because like, I don't, yeah. as a literary critic, I don't necessarily care about what's good in the high art sense. There are definitely people who do. I mm-hmm. care about what's impactful in the culture. Therefore, arguably what's popular is more important to study from my, from my perspective, particular standpoint. That doesn't mean that there's not other you know perspectives and well, ways to I mean, think about it, which is why I study popular culture. Words, it's, why, right. Well, it's, why I study, it's the premise of this show. Sure. It's why this I'm show is like, called what not, it is. Yeah. That's not the only valid way of conducting academic study, mm-hmm. but I think it is kind of, it's one of the kind of tenets of cultural studies. It's saying that what is popular is not inherently bad, but also what is popular is important to pay attention to precisely because it is popular, regardless of its quote unquote aesthetic value. See my mm-hmm. talk about Fifty Shades of Grey, despite yes. me saying that. Look, I don't like making set judgments, but that book is really hard to read. I have not been able to finish it. Mm-hmm. To be fair, I've not tried to finish it in a while, but I, I still think it's an important book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. It, mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, I mean, because I, I didn't approach it the same way that Katya is saying. I actually, like, I didn't approach it from a guilty pleasures thing. It was more everything that I wrote down were things where I'm like, some of these I know people love. Some of them I know people don't. It's not so much about even popular or not. It's it's things where where I might sit down and watch it and go and just say out loud to myself or like staff or whoever I'm watching it with. This is so bad, but I love this. And there and there are like like Riverdale oh, yeah. came up on that last one because there was like like there's a lot of of Riverdale that is frankly ridiculous, but oh, yeah. I en- but I enjoy it because of that. Uh, That's of, part of what I enjoy about that. Yes. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to give just like my first example of, of something that I wrote down this time. Jason and the Argonauts. Jason and the Argonauts is a 1963 um, fantasy movie based on mythology. It has an 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. Tons of people love Jason and the Argonauts. It's got an 89% from critics and a 79% from audience scores. Uh, it, it is... It is a mastery of what I am going to very, very generously call special effects. I mean, the budget well, at, must at have been time, at, fives, at if not time, tens of dollars. <laughs> yeah. At that time, but, it was. Yes, in 1963. But if but to watch it today, like, yeah. you, it, it is... It is humorously ridiculous to look at because it because it is so there's stop motion skeletons that look comically bad. But that's part of what I enjoy about it. Right. Like I also I I I would love to say that as an academic, I'm watching it from a cultural, you know, historic standpoint of this is an important film. The same way I might I might the same thing I might say about Citizen Kane, which I enjoy from I enjoy Citizen Kane academically. I um I, I I recognize that Citizen Kane is not a movie that most people are ever going to want to sit through. It's long um, and long in long in a self-indulgent way, like the Snyder cut, though I'd argue Citizen Kane's better. Um, it is Jason, the Argonauts. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not just saying, trying to make cultural statements about 1963. When I watch that, I'm just going, Oh my God, I love this. It just makes me happy to watch, you know, people swing rubber swords at claymation skeletons and, and like, you know, like this is a completely natural thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Smack people with it. You want to smack people? Like, I guess, I guess that's like, like, I guess the question is like, if you don't feel guilty, like, do you feel like you should hate it, but you don't like? Well, like, I always have the joke of like, I, you know, I only like movies that have explosions in them, which is not entirely wrong. There are exceptions, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, <laughs> it's like I don't feel guilty about that. I guess maybe there's. The way I was thinking about this is like I, I, the example I, I think of a lot, and this is partially because of an academic that I think I have this thing. I often feel guilty. I am I am a serial rewatcher of things. I watch the same bloody movies, TV shows, play the same games over and over again. I am currently just this morning booted up a video game that came up ten years ago, and I am replaying for I don't even want to know how many various files I've started in this game. But anyway, but I, I, and I I think what's the game? Oh, I'm, I started Skyrim again because YouTube oh. decided that I needed to get a deep dive into to Elder Scrolls lore because the algorithm knows me and I'm I'm basic gaming trash apparently. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if other media people feel this outside of the academy, but I think especially people who 
are in our field of work where literally we consume media as a job. I do feel like I am supposed to feel guilty about replaying things and rewatching things because I'm supposed to keep up with all of the different things that are coming out and I should play every new game that comes out. And like, yes, to some extent, I feel pressure to do that, but I also don't really care because it's like, okay, like I don't play every bloody video game like that. I, that doesn't bother me. I don't know. I think that's unfair. I mean, I think it's a pressure that's there, but like I have a friend who's a Moby Dick scholar. Literally, that's what she does. You know, her dissertation was on Moby Dick. And she does right. other stuff. I don't mean that. But is I mean, she like, coming on the show to talk about Moby Dick. No, yeah. I mean, we could maybe. I don't know if we talk about if we do a Moby Dick episode, I'll ask her. But the, the, my point being, and she's not she's a, you know, she's like a maritime literature scholar scholar. But like that's 90 percent of that field. It's like the thing that everybody talks about over and over again. Mm-hmm. There are people who have written volumes and volumes of monographs. We call them just a volume that's on one text. There is. 10 billion times as much written about Moby Dick as the length of Moby Dick and Moby Dick is a long ass book. So I don't think there's a problem with like rewatching or redoing that same thing again. What I think the what I think the interesting part of this conversation is, is exactly the joke you sort of just like you made a snide joke at your at your own expense. Oh, yeah. As you were saying it. Trash. Of, yes. Of being basic gamer trash. And you don't feel, <laughs> you don't feel bad about it. But I think that's where it's interesting. I think I think um, I think well, the context is of this show of this episode is these are things that I know the ridiculousness of me enjoying this. But I do. And here's and here's why I enjoy it. Like it, and you should agree. You should agree with me because Skyrim's awesome because blah, 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 blah. blah. OK, I got one. Yes. OK. All right, Downton Abbey. <laughs> okay, actually, a lot, lots of people a lo- like it. Love, lots of people love it. It won awards. Um, the costumes are beautiful, and some of them are actually from the period. So apparently, like they smelled when the actors wore them. Um, but <laughs> I did not know that. Was interesting. That's okay. a great detail. I, I did not I, know that. <laughs> I I know a, I know a lot of things about down. Like, um, once I was really bored, and for like reasons that don't matter to the point of this, I discovered archive of our own, and I read a hundred thousand words of a Downton Abbey fan fiction that they actually should have probably have just sold uh, to the show because it was better than like what actually happened on that show. The reasons why I don't like Downton Abbey is because it's just blatant monarchist trash. It just mishandles rape on every level beginning in season one. And it turns an Irish revolutionary socialist into a capitalist who saves the monarchy by the end of the movie. And yet, (laughs) yet, because I had AMC A-list, I went to go see Downton Abbey the movie three times. And now it's on HBO Max. And I've watched it several because it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Like the servants, and I guess like spoiler alert at this point, like the servants literally stage an uprising, but not because they're mistreated or they have long hours or they're not paid proper wages, but because they're told to sit down and sit on the sidelines while the like royal servants do the work during the king and queen's visit. So they actually stage an uprising to do more work. And nothing is more transparently hilarious than that. <laughs> and <laughs> I just, I just, it's so funny. I, I actually annoyed several um, people in the theater because I was laughing at parts that weren't supposed to be funny. And for that, I guess <laughs> I'm kind of sorry, but also like, yeah, are I'm you? not, I'm not really, I'm not, no. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I have definitely been in movie theaters where with a bunch of liter- like a bunch of like media scholars and mm-hmm. I think what it comes down to is normal people should should not consume media around media scholars it's just it's just unless you are prepared for live critique and or jokes at like laughing at jokes yeah. that no one else understands you just shouldn't should don't do it it's hard like, to turn like off that Julian part of our Fellows. brain it really is yeah, yeah. Julian Fellows actually ended up adapting <laughs> Julian Fellows actually I, ended up. Oh, go ahead, Wayne. Sorry. No, I, I just I I am so not a serial rewatcher, rereader of things. Some comics. Mm-hmm. Like I you, that whole thing of you, here's something that I don't like, and I, you know, I like Katya. I have a lot of pro- problems with just this whole concept. Like I, if it's something I I don't like or that I do think is bad, I don't rewatch it. But then I don't rewatch things I really love very often either. Right, right. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like always kind of looking for that new thing. And you know, certainly comics, I do. I mean, how many times have I read Mage over the course of the last thirty five years? You just as a as a prime example. 
Right. So I'm more likely to do it with that stuff. But for a lot of it, mo- movies or TV shows, I, I, the ones I have, like the novels and books I've come back to, there there can be a tremendous amount of time in between right. those experiences for me. So I'm coming back to it with very new. But the times you've reread Mage, I mean, you've probably read that several times. I know from being your friend that it is one of your favorite comic books of all time. Yeah. But the and you reread it several times, but Mage represents one percent at best, probably a tenth of a percent of the comics that you read the oh, year, yeah. any given year that you you know right. that you read it right. right? Like it's yeah. it, like so yeah, it's one out of every thousand comic books you you might go back and read and read over and over again. Which I mean, it's sort of the flaw in collecting comics, right? It, it's a fool's gambit because if you're really massively into comics. You know, you're just buying these things that should be disposable because you're only going to read them once. And people Sh- have 30 long boxes of comics that they keep but will never reread. Wait, people are supposed right. to dispose of comics? Initially, um, that was the Initially, idea. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't but know like, why but, this is news to me, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, no, they, just, like, they, the idea of throwing away a comic is just, they, like, they, I don't... They, 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 were che- they were cheap paper. They, yeah. they, they were meant to be read. Well, pulps were like that, too. Yeah, 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 yeah it's, it's exactly... <laughs> It's yeah, exactly the pulps issue. They they mm-hmm. are collectible now because nobody did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or or no, because people's moms did. So the few things that right. remained were. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> but, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna but yeah, it's exactly the pulps issue. Yeah. I'm going to throw in an anecdote about throwing away a comic from my childhood. Um, my my cousin and I were went into town like he'd come to visit. And mom took us into town. We both got a comic. And we're in this little park in town reading reading our comics on a, on a nice summer day. And he finished before me. He's two or three years older. He got up, walked over, threw his comic in the trash, and I lost my fucking mind. <laughs> it's just, maybe this is how... And, and he's, he's like, what? I, I'm never going to read it again. I'm done with it. So, you know, the, the moral of the story is I got two comics that day. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember what his comic was. I have no idea what I got that day, but, but he had an issue with Tomahawk. <laughs> so this is one of those things where, like, I understand cognitively, like, what you're saying, because you're saying, but I think, like, this is, like, media archives, because, or maybe was born to go and spend a lot of time in media archives, because, like, the entire idea of throwing away... Anything? A cop, not even, no, it's, like, throwing away things that I consider art, even if it's art I don't mm. enjoy. Like, even if it's a comic, yeah. I've read comic books, like... And the idea of throwing it away rather than giving it to somebody who would value it or donating it to like a library or collection, I, like yep, I have that. Why would you throw? Away? Although I don't feel the same feel about magazines, which I think is interesting. Oh, I kept all my entertainment weeklies, and yeah, um, my yeah, actually, I think like I, people, I've gotten this from my dad. I, he like he like saved all his magazines. I think my family might just have a lot of books and magazines and games to do- donate to some archive when we all die. That's a dark <laughs> thing to yeah. think about. <laughs> Um, so I want to actually circle back to some of the thing, something that Wayne said. So we're talking about like whether or not we're supposed to like quote unquote hate things or how we feel about hating things. What is it? What do you, when you say you love something mm-hmm. like a novel or a comic book or whatever, like what do you mean? Because like I don't know, like there are games. So actually, Skyrim is a good example. I don't know if I would say like I would I love Skyrim or if it's even in my top favorite games, even though I've logged like hundreds of hours in it. See, that's interesting to me because I mm-hmm. I think I think differently what? than you do, in that I wouldn't. Right, so like, well, I'm interested in what I people, can't imagine what, playing like, something like, for hundreds of hours. Yeah. Well, I, well yeah, there's the, weird the people. things I think of like in my life when I think of books or, or comics or music. I mean, music obviously I listen to over and over. That's like the media exception to something that I, I yeah really yeah do. Um, but, you know, when I agree I, there too. When it's something I I love, a lot of times it is because it reminds me reminds me of a specific time or place in my life, or it's something that. I recognize that this was an essential building block of the person I am. Like, here is a book mm. that changed the way mm. I lived. Here's a book that changed the way I thought about the world. Or something that just purely touched me on this really deep emotional level. And something that will con- that continues to resonate. Because you know, there are things that you read 20 years later, and you don't have the same response to it because you're not the same person. And mm. I find that fascinating. Um, but then I've gone back and read read things that, you know, something that like, oh, my God, this was so significant to me when I was 25. It just spoke to everything in my life. And I reread it 25 years later. It's like, oh, my God, this speaks to everything in my life now that I'm 50. Like, OK, that's there's some power in in the work itself. Mm-hmm. But it's also I read a different book when I was 50 than I did when I was 25, even though so you're bringing something work. different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but if it still resonates, it moves into that category of, oh, this is something I love because this has maintained resonance throughout my 
personal journey. Um, There's a weird example, and it's it's not a bad thing. This is actually probably universally universally considered good. There's a there's the comic Tim, uh, Tom King's uh, Mr. Miracle, mm-hmm. the limited series turned graphic novel that came out. I guess it's been about like three years, something like that. Three, and, two, yeah, yeah. Um, our friends on the protagonist, they analyzed it. And what I thought was fascinating about it was there were three people on that episode, all three of whom were fathers of relatively, relatively young children, um, Joe and Andrew and their guests. And they, they talked about what was amazing about this book is that it's not really a superhero book. It's a book about discovering who you are as a young father. And that's like mm-hmm. the premise. And, and it's like, and, and, and I, I remember listening to their show going, they needed a non dad on this show because while I agree that that is a theme of the book, that's not the one that stands out to me. To me, it's, to, and they barely talked about this. To me, that entire book is about dealing with, um, it's about dealing with mental depression and trying to live up to your grown up responsibilities, not a fatherhood, but of your lack of inability to live up to your own father. Like I've got a, like I've got a completely different reading on it, which I think right. is obviously valid um, mm-hmm. because it's because it's mine. But the I mean, the very big difference is all three of them had um, toddlers or babies at the that's time they recorded they that episode. Right and that's where they yeah. are in their life. Yeah. And that is a part of that book. But mm-hmm. like, but like it opens like the book opens with an attempted suicide. That's like on page one. And they barely mentioned it. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's what this to me. That's what this is about, because that's what that's just what what struck me as interesting. And I think what I think what Wayne just said is is true. Like you move you move to something at a different point. A, a truly good piece of literature is one that, you know, can say different things to different people, depending on what they need it to say. I also would just add, I think there's a difference between loving something and enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Like, I do not love oh, Downton yeah. Abbey. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make that like, because I, I know we tentatively call this bad things we love to, but I think that was just a shorthand for mm-hmm. something more complicated. I don't love Downton Abbey. Um, mm-hmm. I, I disagree with almost every po- political thing Downton Abbey has ever tried to say, perhaps even all of them, because... Julian Fellows is basically trying to do Anthony Trowell up the 19th century novelist um, and has been an adaptation of one of that man's books uh, in the early 20th century. Um, uh, Trollop and I have a war between us that no one who listens to this show cares about. Um, but <laughs> but it's, it's like it's like Cotty and Henry James, uh, probably. Um, but yeah, I, no one wants to hear that episode. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't even want to hear that episode. Yeah. <laughs> Trollope and Henry James. Let's see if we get down to zero listeners. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I do. I think. I think in some ways you might say my enjoyment of Downton Abbey is perverse. But like, there are things that I do love. I actually uh, something that I have loved most of my life is strangely Artemis Fowl, the Arctic incident. I don't know why I loved it. I just did. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I think it's like the most emotionally like resonant book of that series. And after the, um, horrible movie from Disney came out, which truly is horrible. Um, it's one of the, it's like, she is a great, it's horrible. And unlike it, she is a great, it's not important. Um, but it is a little terrifying. <laughs> um, I, I reread the Arctic instant because I was like, you know, I may, maybe I misread, remembered like loving this as a child and no, it still brought me to tears. Um, I could definitely read it a lot faster than I was when it first came out. <laughs> but, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like there are just, you know, certain characters or stories that speak to me on some level. I, I've talked about some of them like Daniel Deronda or The Good Place and perhaps the characters I identify with tell you way too much about me as a human being. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe just because I'm, I'm a sentimental at heart, but I, you know, the, the, the um, Oh, the meme that was floating around Facebook, it, it pops up every once in a while. It's name you, 10 most important comics or your most loved comics. Oh, or, or your most loved. Yeah. That's and, impossible. You know, yeah, impossible, exactly. But I mean, for myself, I narrow that down to, and I, I use the phrase when I posted this, the things that are, for me, heart books. And like, you know, like, I don't love Watchmen. I don't love Dark Knight. I think they're fascinating. I think they need to be studied. I think they, they change the world, I, the world of comics. Um, there's so much talk about them. I, I, there are things I've reread, but I don't love them in the way that I love Mage or Zot mm-hmm. or Elfquest or some of these things that spoke to 
my soul in a way. You know, Watchmen was always an intellectual endeavor for me. I wonder, yeah. yeah, even yeah. even even then. I wonder even if there's then. a yeah. I wonder if there's if there's a difference though, because I I think now with you just saying that, I'm sort of comparing this to exactly what Katya just said originally, which is about you being a you know a repeat viewer of things that you enjoy. Um, and I'm not unless it's something that I'm writing, unless it's work. Like I'll watch something mm-hmm. a couple times if I if it's part of a dissertation or an article for uh for a collection or a journal or or if I'm teaching it in a class right like like i've i've read watchmen and persepolis and all the comics that i teach for you know for intro classes very very often more recently because i've taught them i've read tarzan several times because i've taught it um or wonder boys or you know these are books that like if it becomes work sure i'll go back right. to things that but i don't often very rarely do i reread or even rewatch things just for fun i have to really enjoy it mm-hmm. i mean I, I i think about like these things where people like where i know people who are like oh my god i saw what's the big avengers endgame i saw avengers endgame in the theater seven times why why yeah. would you do that that's that, that, that's yeah. my response to it i See, don't and i i always and i think this is just like the different ways that we consume media in general and just like mm. what our preferences are. Cause I've always been like that. Right. I think academia made it more, made it more of a habit than it was previously. Mm-hmm. But like I played, we even just talked about the differences of things that we love. Like the top video game, I will probably always mention of like media that I love will always be Ocarina of Time because it was the first video game I ever beat by myself. And like, I am a giant Zelda, especially like OG Zelda nerd. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I and I certainly don't mean to to judge people who do rewatch sure. things because everybody right. you know, consumes media in different ways psychologically. And I, I've I've seen some studies on this, and you know, children tend to re- rewatch things over and over and over and over again. And there's something about it that is comforting. That idea of you know the mm-hmm. end, you know how this plays out. So the anxiety of not knowing the end isn't there. There's something comforting mm-hmm. about reengaging with something that you already know um, that can be soothing and relaxing and whatever in a way that something new isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and 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 that's a valid a- approach to to media. I mean, I that's what records and you know albums mm-hmm. are for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've actually learned recently. This is a big. I feel like people are talking more about mental health this year than ever. I yeah. wonder, wonder why. why. Yeah. But one of the things I've actually seen a lot of articles of, of like some people pointing out to your point, Wayne. Like, oh, a lot. Like a lot of people are rewatching this like nostalgia TV mm-hmm. or yeah. nostalgia movies or like in my case nostalgia games because it is a source of comfort. And I basically realized like ah. This explains <laughs> someone who's being diagnosed with anxiety. I'm like, I now understand. And this is not to pathologize different people's media no. habits, but like, I think it's like understanding that like this, I mean, I think especially like your, your mental health and like whatever you may or may not have been diagnosed with, it's just like, that is part of a, a piece of what influences who you are and your habits in many ways. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, like I don't consume media that way because I have anxiety, nor do I have anxiety because I consume media like that. It's just like, these are two pa- aspects of like, like aspects of who I am and they just happen yeah. to kind of like bounce well, off of each other. I wonder yeah. if it's even the exact, the exact opposite, right? Like, like maybe, maybe one of the things that makes not, not, not necessarily us, but I mean, a, a person in general, a person who is a rewatcher of things who does that for that comforting feeling, you know, that's, you knowing how to manage your own what? mental health in a, in a, in an extremely healthy way. You didn't go out and kill sure. something. Well, you re, you rewatch, you know, the great British Bake Off for the 18th it, time or whatever. It, it's pop, it's pop culture ritual. I mean, the idea mm-hmm. of ritual in, in religion is you, you redo the mm-hmm. same actions over and over right. the repetition of it is comforting uh it, mm-hmm. it, yeah you know. and it, it's also a different kind of kind of what we we're saying at the top of the show it's like it's a different kind of appreciation like you can appreciate something i when we study something we read it more times than we really care to necessarily for our enjoyment it's because you get to appreciate it in a different level i mean i mean this is one of the reasons why like i i always say i have two different ways of reading i read for just for funsies essentially mm-hmm. which is and disengaging as much as possible the analytical brain all over it, although it never really goes away. Mm-hmm. And then the other part of it is doing the line by line like analysis of something where it takes me an hour to read five pages. And that's not not enjoyable. Like for a lot of people, I think that sounds like the worst experience ever. <laughs> but I find that enjoyable. I mean, I remember the first time I still have the copy of the first book I ever like, like, you know, like a really annoying, overbearing academic when I was in middle school. And it was fun. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Also because I used cartoon sticky notes with cartoons on them, and that really oh, helped. Did, did, did you use <laughs> different Which I colors? I still do, to... actually. Also, yeah. as as an actual academic, I still have fun <laughs> sticky notes. That is that is how you do. I, I don't. I, my my mine are just colors, but they're but I, but different colors mean different things that only I can. The decode. ones I used to mark up my own dissertation had puppies on them. I remember those. I am boring and just and just have one color pin and a notebook full of notes that only I can understand. Um, yeah, I, that's what I have. There's also the. This is a different thing, but there's also the pleasure of of the personal database uh, because Evernote is 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 fabulous, and I love having a searchable note database. That oh, so spans over a decade. I'm literally I, staring at it right now for my notes for this, though. Yeah, I. Yeah, I. I mean, I do, I do admit I have a rotation of films. I, I think that like sort of film replaced books and TV for me after grad school because television, mm-hmm. I still liked to, you know, sit in one place at one time and I lost my antenna and I know I sound like I'm from another time. Yeah. I don't care. Antenna? Um, yes, and antenna. No one's had an antenna since before you were born. Like, um, <laughs> what is an antenna? Is, that is not entirely accurate, but we don't need to get into that. Um, I lost my antenna. I lost my TV privileges and I don't really, I, I feel like I, I own or have access to a lot of streaming services, but they overwhelm me at times. But like every Christmas, got to rewatch the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, mm. Every couple of months, if I feel anxiety, The Mummy or Jurassic Park is going to go on. Uh, recently, uh, Knives Out has been added to the list. Anytime I want to cry, 13 going on 30 will be playing or insert uh, romantic comedy here that's good. Um, like When Harry Met Sally or You've Got Mail. So mm. I just I just have like, I don't know, a rotation of like 10 or 15 movies where I'm going to watch them. They're they're real good. They make me feel good. Uh, no one will ever change my mind. And then, you know, LA Confidential, whenever I can handle it. <sighs> um, I, I, I just think this is interesting because I don't even have that with music. Like I've got I've got mm-hmm. there, there's certainly music that like I, I re-listen to and there are books that I've reread and there's movies. But but I don't have anything that I can think of where I'm where I can go. I'm sad. I need to go watch blah, blah, blah again. Like I, I, I have weird yeah. phases where or there will there will be a time where I'm like, there'll be a time where I'm just sitting down and I'll just be like, okay, I mean, just to name an example, like I've seen I've seen Avengers Endgame all the way through three, maybe four times, you know, um, but there are times where I'm just like, I'm in a mood to just go watch the battle scene or maybe the time heist scene or, you know, like there might, there might be something like that, or I might very well, it might be something that it's a whole movie where I'm, where I'm going to go, you know what? I haven't watched in forever. And I just really want to see right now, Star Trek four, why four? I don't know, but I'm in the mood for four, you know, like, like I, like that happens, but there's nothing where I can say, and maybe it's happening because it's just, this will make me happy right now, but it wouldn't in any other circumstance other than that exact thing. So like I have things yeah. where I might recall right. it just for this one time, you know, this one time, I think I'll smile if I watch Harry met Sally, but next time yeah. I need to smile, it's going to be die hard. Like yeah. I can't, I can't explain yeah. that. I, don't know. I have like the go to, I don't really have go to like feel good media either. It's just like, yeah, it's just sort of like, for me, it's always like what, I come back around to like what's a particular world or story I want to re-experience. Like right now I'm re-watching all of the Star Wars movies in order in rapid fire, which by the way, I totally recommend because I don't know. It's just fun. Some of them will it's not make you nice. feel good. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Hannah has to, and then Hannah has to be like rant about gender politics in it. And then we just like go off on the thing I'm texting because I apparently, because I don't post on Twitter, I feel the need to eventually live tweet my viewing <laughs> habits to my friends directly because that's uh, normal. Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to hear them. If I like, I, you probably, you might want to hear my thoughts on Star Wars. I don't know if Twitter wants I to mean, hear my I thoughts on Star Wars. Because yeah. I know that we are of a, a similar mind on these things. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but it's like, it's like, I'm, you know, I didn't even Skyrim, like I, even though I would not, like I said, I wouldn't say that Skyrim's like a, for me, like one of those, like, I, I like the way that Wayne, you had talked about like the, the, you know, books of the heart kind of thing. Like for me, Skyrim is not that, but it's a world I find interesting and it's an, like, and it's an expansive world and it's fun to kind of just like wander around it. And I also like building houses. Um, it's therapeutic, you know? <laughs> now the, the, the music thing, I mean, I am always 
you know, looking for new music. I, I love discovering new stuff. And you know, I have so much in my collection. And with things like Spotify and streaming, you can just listen to mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. But as much as I listen to a wide range of stuff, and just every once in a while, I need to hear Ziggy Stardust. You know, just like, and, and it's not even for a specific, ooh, this is the mood I'm in. Just something that really makes me go, oh, I haven't listened to that for a while. Yeah, that, and, and I, I will say I've done that with, with music. But I don't know. I, it's, I can't say there's a specific trigger, which I think is weird. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious about one thing, because you just said, you know, you, of everyone I know in the world, you are probably the biggest music consumer, which is not to say that, like, like I just, I don't, under, I don't, I need people, I need the listener to understand that when, um, when, when I say Wayne is a music consumer, there's this book that both of us, both of us have. It's an interesting book just on music, on pop music, and it's called The Thousand Albums You Must Listen to Before You Die or something like that. Is it, isn't it the title? Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. It's, it's something along those lines. I'll link it in the show notes of, yeah. um, later, but, um, it's and it's it's an academic exercise of you know here is a music critic talking about you know the history of music and Wayne went and listened to them in, in order, order for some fucking reason for like, two, <laughs> like, for like two and a half years and, right. and through the library oh and through the library and my own collect it starts with Frank Sinatra 1955 and comes up like 2004. I mainly I, love this because it's like the OP music version of like reading the dictionary. Yeah, no, right. I love it. And it was exactly th- that. Of the thousand <laughs> albums based on accessibility through Spotify and the library and whatever, I listened to 987 albums. Right. I don't think I've ever listened to that in my life. Can we get one? Can we? black because geez that's impressive and, yeah. it was, and it was and i listened to other stuff around that like i didn't just sure. limit myself to that but it was it was a fascinating experiment in hearing and, and it was rock and jazz and country i mean it sort of really spanned the the genre yeah. it's literally was, the history of pop music 20th century like, to yeah. till now yeah and, <laughs> it was fascinating to hear the movements and the transitions and to hear even albums that i'm really familiar mm-hmm. with hearing them in context with everything else that came out that year. And, and like, that's so there's fascinating. That album from 1972 by or 73 by the dictators. And, you know, I listened to it was like, Oh, this is the album that if, if you say punk music to people who don't listen to music, this is the album they hear in their brain. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and, this, and this is the first one. Here it is. This is where, you know, and not, so, that, not that culturally that's specifically where punk started. Cause that's a much bigger conversation. So but, the reason I brought that up though, because this is weird, right? Cause like, it's a weird I, I, fucking it, amazing um, thing that you did. It's, 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 it's OCD and crazy is what it is. Yeah. Uh, but but <laughs> like in a beautiful and like wonderful, like media nerd way. <laughs> right, right. But here's what it's interesting. Like, and, 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 and I swear if the guy writes a sequel next month, we should say, uh, what, what's the actual album title and the guy and the author's name? Cause I don't want to keep saying that guy. 1001 albums you must hear before you die. And it's edited by Robert Demery. The individual entries were written by a variety of people who are listed in here. Right. And, and, okay. and, and there there's, you know, they're essentially reviews of the albums and why they're included. At no point in this book does he give the reasons of like, oh, here are the parameters we use. There were some things like Saturday Night Live is not on the list because it's a soundtrack album compilation of different artists. So mm-hmm. he ruled that out. Uh, greatest hits compilations don't count. Right, right. Which, so, you know, so- that makes sense, but... It makes sense, except for some uh, it's complicated. But anyway, my my point <laughs> I was like, there. My point being with with something like that, I don't remember the last time I bought an album anymore. Um, I really don't. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure it was probably at a show. Like, I'm sure the. I don't know what the last album I bought, the last CD I bought was, for instance. But I'm sure I probably went to. It's, it's like some smaller band where I probably went to a bar to see them. And I was like, I would like to support these people. Let right. me give you $10 yeah. to mm-hmm. buy I, beer with more than my, more than yeah. anything. Right. I mostly stream. I still yeah. buy CDs occasionally. Not not like okay. I used to, but I, occasionally for yeah. very specific artists who I want to support. I okay. purchased my last CD on January 31st, 2020, when Kesha's High Road came out. And <laughs> okay. uh, I... Whenever Anyone it's who did not see that coming yeah. should should, um, should be I, sad I, a little bit. My my car still has a CD player, so um, it it's gotten as much play as one CD in a car can when 
one is not going much anywhere during COVID. And uh, <laughs> um, I all whenever like Rainbow came out, I also bought the final version, and uh, that shouldn't surprise anyone because uh, I, I basically I I know no music that's current except for Kesha, and I'm fine with that. I only know what Spotify's algorithm thinks that I should listen to based off of everything else, which actually is my favorite thing because I, I try to listen to that list every week. It's well, <laughs> it's not even that particular list. It's just like it's the entire phenomenon of like my, I think my entire music for probably the last at least the last decade has been determined by a combination of the weird like whatever you know random emo i don't even know what to call like emo alternative something i used to listen to in middle school as you do when you're 12 plus the much more varied and interesting music taste of my friends over the years as interpreted by an algorithm yeah mm-hmm. and, and yeah for, for people who, who don't subscribe to spotify as a premium member mm-hmm. like every week spotify compiles here's a 30 song playlist based on an algorithm of other stuff you've been playing right and it, it's and really it, it is kind of all over the map and i i do i you know i love discovering new music i try mm-hmm. to listen to that 30 song list every week and i've discovered a lot of new stuff and there's a lot of stuff i don't care about and there's a lot of stuff like yeah i know what this is you know <laughs> but but mm-hmm. I, I make the effort because i i like hearing new stuff yeah and it's mainly and before that for me it was like pandora like that like at, at this point like i've been using some service in some capacity probably since college so like mm-hmm. and i feel like i've gotten to the point where especially a lot of my friends my friends music taste like i have entirely like, people have complimented me on some of my some of my uh playlists for like parties and stuff i take zero credit it is all that my friends have way better music taste than i do and i just steal their music and i'm the one that happens to make the playlist so i get it but like a lot of their tastes are super global or super fascinating or like very niche and i just kind of like am a sponge for all of it mm-hmm. which means i feel like sometimes spotify's algorithm is just like what do you actually like <laughs> <laughs> because I, I've joked for years and I have no music taste other than just I am I am the amalgamation of like the music taste of about 80 people. <laughs> no curation. Isn't, isn't that what all I mean, not just music, isn't that what we all are for for media? I mean, it, it's one of the weird things about being a, being a pop culture scholar, just to like circle back. Right. It's not so much a you know, guilt or you, you talked about the high, low culture not really existing. This is just the importance of popular culture. I listen to stuff like, why do I listen? Why do I have a career today? I have a career today that involves comics because in order to shut me up once 40 years ago, my mom bought me a comic book just to get, you know, to, to quiet me down when I was, when we were going somewhere for some, and that like it hooked me. Right. Cause I'd read other stuff, but it was just like a, Hey, do this. And it fascinated me. Or um, I, I used to read comics on on the plane flying. I, I grew up in Cleveland. My dad, uh, my parents were divorced. My, my dad lived in Houston. So on the plane in either direction, they would just buy me a bunch of comic books to uh, to read. So things like that, like got me into, you know, essentially, you know, led me towards a career. But like the things that I like, whether they're comics or music or movies are a weird amalgamation of tastes based on my life experiences, things that people uh, that other friends have recommended to me, um, just academic things that I've learned. Like, like I appreciate, I I can't, like I said, I can't recommend Citizen Kane to everybody because I think that, I think that a lot of people like to say they, they like Citizen Kane. I don't love Citizen Kane. It's fine. I enjoy, I enjoy its importance, but I think Citizen Kane mostly is is an exercise in film appreciation in the art of of what film is more than it is a good narrative right so like i but i think the things that mav likes are just this conglomeration of weird influences from you know a couple dozen different rather disparate you know Mm -hmm. like circumstances randomness of what we were Mm -hmm. exposed to at any given moment in our life Mm -hmm. oh yeah absolutely like i you know i I mean i often think about like how i became a literary scholar and then i look back and i'm like oh no that made sense that's logical (laughs) (laughs) the the short version is is, uh books were my friends and um Yeah. I, I mean, I think that might explain why I like have like certain favorites I constantly return to in media because I have a strange one sided relation. Well, yeah, probably is a one sided relationship.
relationship with my books and my movies and <laughs> one sided relationship because because they don't care about you. But is, yeah, that what you're, yeah. I mean, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like, <laughs> like I wasn't I, sure. Like, like, yeah, like the books are not alive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's the, that. Yes. Okay. That's what I'm saying. That's that's why it's a one sided relationship. <laughs> Just because my book just checking. You can't just tell me <laughs> if 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 I had a two if there was a if there was a uh relational uh a two way relationship between me and media, well, we all know what would have happened on multiple shows where Hannah's complained for three years now about all the things that she wanted to happen and then didn't see Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> but I I don't know. So I'm going to resolve, resolve nothing. nothing. <laughs> you resolve yeah. nothing. I feel like this is not the episode. I, I, and we, yeah, we yeah, what is this episode? episode? What? Yeah, we, well, we I was, we I was just thinking that for luring them in with a promise that we didn't I, follow up on. Well, I, I, I think the title of this is you know bad things we love with bad and we love both crossed out, so it's just going to be things. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> well, it's a meta conversation about what it means to love or hate something. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah and and I and I, and I guess somehow like, oh, somehow like, I'm going to have to figure out how to write that in a description for this episode i think it's an important show i think we you know we resolved nothing but i think we talked about more than we even normally do because we didn't stick to one like this was going to be a listicle show but we are sort of just meta cognitively talking about the nature of literature but not it's not like our taste we did we did a whole show on taste and stuff we're not doing that either it's more of a you know how the the nature of how we enjoy media we not even necessarily being cultural you know, as a culture we being the four of us and i think that's actually valid in a lived yeah. experience weird kind of way you know what yeah. i mean i think this is the this is the version of what ha- what happens when you Wayne and Katya <laughs> basically do the philosophical equivalent of putting their foot down and saying and and, and throwing a tantrum of no <laughs> Again, I don't <laughs> think that things are bad, except for insert Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, and like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I, 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 I just, I can't, I can't compliment. Yeah, I think there are certainly bad things out there, but but at the same time, there are certainly people who enjoy those bad things. And once again, if they're not hurting anybody, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have no quibbles about anyone enjoying it. Yeah, to me, the, the thing that makes something actually bad, which I feel like, especially in the last year, we've had a lot of these episodes, but also just the show in general, is like, if you are producing, if it's media that actually harms somebody by per- perpetuating a harmful narrative, like that's the only time where I feel like this is a bit, and even then, yeah, I was gonna say, even then it's questionable. We like, talk about all the time is it's like, it's not necessarily the things you consume, the way you consume it and the way you talk about it, because yeah. there is no media, like there's shades of like awful, horrendous to like, or at least really problematic, but there is no purely like, mm-hmm. okay media. A few weeks ago, we did that show or again, for a context of when we're recording this, we did a show on um, sex and cartoons in, in children's cartoons. And that's where we had the Pepe Le Pew. I mean, I guess we, it was a lot of me ranting about how horrible it was. <laughs> um, but I don't think anyone we, on that show disagree with you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and essentially calling for the cancellation of Pepe Le Pew, which Twitter decided to do three days later. And I'm like, well, why, you know, I don't know why, why aren't we getting credit for this? And we're not because I, I don't think we really caused it. But even then, I don't think that Pepe Le Pew is necessarily bad, even in that, like, I don't think it's harmful so much as I think not having critical conversations in general yeah. is harmful. So I'm glad we had that show. And I'm glad as frustrating as, you know, I've had, I've had a weird few days arguing on Facebook with people about this. And I think that argument is an important thing that it, it, it's good happens. In that it prompts the, it's good in that it prompts the conversation or sure. Right. So like, you know, there are, and I think that, I think that's true of many, many things. And we opened, I, I said at the beginning of the show, Snyder cut of justice league came out a couple of days ago and I don't, I didn't love it. I mean, I didn't hate it. I mean, I, 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 I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. I thought I was going to be like really, really annoyed there. I had a few good things to say about it. I had a bunch of bad things to say about it, but mostly I was like, this left me feeling exactly like the two hour version only for four hours. But if you love that, I get it. You, you, you should happily love it. Danny Anderson, another friend of our show, he, he said in his review, his, his very short review of it, 
is it's the internet and we live in a world of binary opinion. So you have to say something is either absolutely great or absolutely horrible. And so by those, by that metric, he absolutely loves Snyder cut. And my response to him was absolute absolutism is always wrong. Always. (laughs) (laughs) And I, but I don't know how else to, I don't think it's really absolute. And I know Danny doesn't necessarily actually feel that way. He does. He does actually enjoy Zack Snyder's films more than I do. And he has tired of having the argument. (laughs) Yeah. He's, he's very tired, but he also has, frankly pretty reasonable reasons to feel the way he does mm-hmm. he's wrong but he's my friend so i can say that um but, <laughs> hi, danny. hi danny but 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 i get what he i i get that there are reasons to like something wayne you said to me another friend of ours our friend mikey loves those movies and they're sort of um I don't even know how to say it because it's going to sound almost trite, like an insult. And I I really don't mean it this way. I admire how much she can unabashedly love a thing. Yeah. I, there are times <laughs> I'm envious of, of that. Yes. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, cause I, I, he'll, he'll see something. He'll be like, that was the greatest thing. And he'll say it a lot. Or, or Jamil, my former roommate who's been on our show. Um, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I was like, since since you said the same thing about the movie you watched last week, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, I, but they do they thoroughly enjoy it and right. and, and it's good sincere. You know, it, and it is. It's absolutely sincere, and I I admire that. And it's and not I'm, me. Yeah, but I don't think I'm better because of it. I right. I think I right. I think I have more to say because you know we we just filled an hour and fifteen minutes talk, talking about it. We we all talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, but, but but like I I love that there are people out there who can. You know, Wayne, you've said this so many times. Love what you love. It's fine. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. just yeah. love what you love and then think critically about it sometimes what, to make sure what, that yeah. you're not. Or don't, you know. <laughs> I think part of Mikey's point, not, not to speak for someone who isn't here, but I think part of his point, and I get this. Now, you and I had a, a Facebook conversation about this earlier. Um, I, he gets very tired of, and as do I, of the people who claim to be these huge fans of this thing, whether it's movies or comics or whatever, and then do nothing but spend 80% of their time, 90% of their time, whatever, bitching about it. You know, they, they enjoy the bitching about the thing they love more than they do loving the thing they love. Mm-hmm. And as I said to you in that, that thread, you know, I saw that in the store all the time. People who would just mm-hmm. me great fripping wadges of cash for things and do nothing but bitch about how bad comics are. I, and have I, been for 30 years. And have so. been for 30 years. I, and I remember a conversation <laughs> with, with a customer a long time ago who just, you know, like, I just, I, I, he just, he was just complaining about everything he was reading. And he was someone who was buying a lot of comics and week after week after week, all he did was complain about it. And he finally asked me one day, and this is someone I had a good relationship with. So I felt comfortable. He's like, what do you recommend? And I said, another hobby, because this one is obviously bringing you no joy, (laughs) which might not be the best thing for a retailer to say to someone who's handing him money. (laughs) <laughs> but it kind of made him pause, you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, like, why are you continuing to do this if you're obviously not enjoying this anymore? Um, so, yeah, I and I so I fully understand that frustration on the part of Mikey or anybody else of just, you know, people just doing nothing but complain about these things. And you know, I am old enough to remember if I'd seen anything like this Justice League movie 30 years ago, it would have blown my mind. You know, we, we are living in an era where we have so much more access, you know, the, going back to the Manimal joke. We watch Manimal because that's all there fucking was. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and now everything is this and, and people still aren't happy. Um, so. <laughs> Pages were fun. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but yeah, love what you love. Not to repeat myself, but love what you love and enjoy it. And 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 echo what Kat you just said, but also be a little critical at times. You know, I mean, I, I think you can, there's room for both. And you mm-hmm. know, sometimes the and that critique, can be fun too. Yeah, yeah. Critical and, thinking and, is yeah. enjoyable. Just don't be an awful person about it. Yeah. Or if you are, be on our podcast so that you know we can at least get some some listeners out of it. And it can yeah. lift. It can. It can. It can lift the thing you're watching because if you really watch crawl um a movie about a hurricane with giant gators in it you see that really the gators symbolize the demons and trials keeping the father and daughter fighting for their lives apart and there is actually a beautiful human story that encapsulates the (laughs) storm and i know i'm serious like i'm not like I'm not making I've, this up. It's actually I'm laughing because like, I thought you were. I thought you said crawl at first, which is a t- totally different movie. No crawl. Crawl. 
Crawl the Conqueror, which is a yeah. movie I enjoy, but <laughs> no, like I don't but, know this film. <laughs> uh, it, I believe it's on Hulu, uh, and 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 it even has wonderful symmetry. Like she's a Florida Gator, like with UF and a college student, and <laughs> then she has to outswim the Gators. I I love it. <laughs> um, I had so, so many things that I wa- that I wanted to recommend that were that just were again. This was going to be a silly show. I think we had a very fascinating deep conversation that like I, I didn't get to talk about. Not another teen movie, which is which I adore. <laughs> no, my my uh, mother. You just have a different episode without me and Wayne. Uh, well, you know, I think that we enjoy talking about the films that we enjoy. So I. I enjoy talking to you guys. I love you guys. There you go. <laughs> that's the end. That's the end of the <laughs> we can end stuff now. Oh, okay. Uh, Hannah, where can people find you? You can find me at boxpopcast.com where we post blogs about our upcoming shows. Sometimes they match what we end up talking about. You can leave us comments <laughs> that help guide our discussion if we can focus. Uh, so <laughs> That was great. And, uh, Katya. <laughs> you could just find me here. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but it's at Vox Podcast on all of the social medias. Oh, I look at them sometimes. It is better when I when when you guys just plug this show and I don't have to like worry about that. <laughs> Wayne. You can find me here and you can leave us all a five star review because that gooses the algorithms and uh God knows we need goosing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I, I, I just there's no there's no clean way response to that. So, <laughs> do you do you know what this show is? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, all of the places, always at Chris Maverick. Um, they already plugged the show, so follow us there. Follow us on the YouTubes where we need more subscribers. Like and subscribe, hit bells, do things like that. That helps the show get more popular, just like the five star reviews and whatever it was Hannah and Wayne just said. Um, and. I would like to thank Maximilian of Thoughtform Music for our epic theme song building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd like to thank you at home for listening and apologize if you were really looking forward to what we said we were going to talk about, but I hope this was more interesting. (laughs) Tune in next time to see if we follow the script or not. (laughs) And we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.